Our worship series began in, on Easter Sunday. We're talking about a holy life, living a holy life. And uh, way back, way back on Easter is when we began uh, this series. And it's taken us through the last two chapters of the Gospel according to John, chapters 20 and 21. And today's scripture finishes the Gospel of John in chapter 21, starting the story with verse 15. You'll recall from last week that Jesus had shared with his disciples a breakfast of bread and fish on the beach by the lake of the Sea of Galilee. And so we pick up the story when they had finished breakfast. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? So when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. But Jesus didn't say to him that he would not die. He only said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. We know that his testimony is true. But there are also Many other things that Jesus did, if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And this is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week I had a conversation with a friend of mine, a member of this church, uh, and it was a conversation that I had had dozens of times over the course of my ministry. Uh, Been in ministry for 20 years, starting in 1993 as a part-time choir director and then a full-time director of music and associate pastor and then lead pastor of two different churches. And I've had this conversation, I don't know, dozens of times at least, some variation of the same theme. She came into my office and said, I'm experiencing something in my life just recently. And I don't know what it is, but it's good. I really like it. It's like I can sense God's presence in a way that I never have been able to before. It's like I'm having these spiritual thoughts, these spiritual ideas. I've just been very, very connected to God in these recent weeks or months. And I I don't know what it's all about. I don't know where it's leading me. I don't know what this call is, but but it's, it's exciting. It's good. I'm always curious to know where that sensation comes from. So I asked her, was this a... Uh, a big change that happened that you noticed right when it happened? I mean, was there one big moment that, that before that moment things were just normal and then after that moment you had this sense of God's presence? I mean, were, did you like drive past a burning bush on your way home from work one day and, and, and sense God's presence? I mean, was there something big? And she said, no. 95% of the time it's It's not. It's just a little push here and there. It's just a little nudge 
in this moment and the next. It's just a little glimpse of God's presence here and there, and, and over time, it accumulates. Over time, it adds up. And then you notice it. Looking back, you can see it. She said to me, just recently, I've decided to be more involved with the church. I've decided to spend more time here. I've decided to really commit myself more to being a part of the church. And I've noticed a difference when I do that. And that, to me, was the answer. That's where it came from for her. That deepening of her commitment, that conscious choice to deepen one's commitment to Christ, to, to engage more fully with the service of worship, to be more regular in attendance and participation, to, to, to be a part of a Bible study, to, to dig deeply into the Holy Word and learn as much as possible as you can, to, to commit to, to serving in the community in a brand new way, something new, something different, some way that, that you, have, you have become more fully engaged with the life of the church. It, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. It feels good. And I think I know why. Because when you do that, you're, you are, you're noticing what God is doing in the world. And you're deciding to cooperate with, with what God's up to. You are cooperating with the grace of God to make this world a better place. And grace feels good. Grace is how God works in the world. And God, whose very character is love, is so active in the world, and when you make a decision that you're going to cooperate with what God's up to, that you're going to engage more fully, that you're going to commit more deeply, that you're going to allow your pattern of discipleship to expand more fully, it feels good. You notice a difference. And no, hardly any of us get a burning bush, but when we do make that decision on our own, whatever it is, when we get that nudge, when we get that little push, and we say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to commit, I'm going to engage, we can sense it. We can feel it. It impacts our whole life, every aspect of our whole life. and gets better when we make that conscious decision. I hope that the pieces of this puzzle have begun to fit into place for you over the course of this series. Way, way back on Easter Sunday, which, what was that, like three years ago? Way... It's like a whole baseball season ago for Royals fans. Uh, the, uh, I figure I should mention the Royals as often as possible considering that I mentioned them last week and then they promptly went 4-1 and one for the week and I think if I keep on saying it, I'm just kidding. Way back, way back on Easter Sunday, we, we talked about this life being victorious. The holy life is a victorious life and it is victorious over death itself and if it's victorious over death itself, there's nothing in all of this world that life cannot be victorious over, including sin. And that means, week two, that the holy life is a forgiven life. That we are forgiven of our sin, but we're not forgiven just for our own sake. We are forgiven so that we can be forgiving to others. A holy life is a forgiven life, and it is a forgiving life. Knowing that we are forgiven gives the holy life a sense of confidence, that sense of confidence that Chris preached about a couple weeks ago, that we will have doubts, we will have questions, we will wonder, but in spite of those doubts, in spite of those questions, and sometimes because of those doubts, because of those questions, we will have confidence to live our lives in relationship with God. The confidence that we experience leads us to live lives of expectation and hope, lives of promise, Last week we talked about how the holy life is an expectant life. It expects good things to happen in spite of evidence to the contrary. Like I'm expecting my voice to hold out in spite of evidence to the contrary. <clears throat> <clears throat> the expectation of this holy life is that this life will be filled with love. And that is what we turn to this week. We expect because we are forgiven, because we are confident, because this holy life is victorious, we expect God's love to fill us up. To fill us up as the church, to fill us up as individuals in the community, to fill us up with love so full that it overflows 
into everything we say, into everything we do, into everything we are. That's what we're going to talk about this week. The expectancy of being filled with God's love, a love-filled life. What can be said about love other than it's, it's all you need? <laughs> what can be said about love is that, except that it's a many-splendored thing? What can be said about love? So much has been said about love. I mean, it's the core of everything, isn't it? It's God's very identity. God is love. It's, it's the greatest commandment. Love God. Love one another. It's Jesus' new commandment, his final commandment to his disciples. He's saying to them at the Last Supper, look, guys, all I'm saying is this. Just love one another in the same way that I've loved you. It is everything that is. It, it infuses our lives. Love is, we could sing about it all day. I could sing of your love forever. I should write a song. Wait. There's so many. Like, you can't say anything new. What's your favorite? Let's, let's play a game. Let's see how good we can do. See if 1050 service can beat 930. 20 seconds. All right. Lo think of love songs. Right? 20 seconds. We'll see how many love songs we can shout out in 20 seconds. Ready? Go. All you need is love. All out of love. Can you feel the love tonight? Excellent. Love me tender. All right. You're too polite, Johnny. Just shout. Just shout. All you need is love. Jesus loves me. Endless love. That one. <clears throat> it's good. I mean, you could get, we could go styles. We could go subcategories. Okay, only Beatles songs now. <laughs> only country western. Well, that's a different kind of love, but, you know. <clears throat> we could, it, it infuses everything uh, in our lives. This, this. So there's really nothing. I mean, what more could I possibly say in the next 10 minutes that, well, 15, 20, you know, uh, about, about love that hasn't already been said? I mean, it, it, it's in, it's in list, literature, it's in history, it's in poetry, it's in music. I bring a great historical document known as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone to share. Do you realize, by the way, that this is a part of history now, that there are people in this room Freshman uh, and soft, if you're a freshman or sophomore in high school, you have not known a world without Harry Potter. Are you kidding me? Listen to Harry Potter. This is actually what Dumbledore says to Harry at the end of the first book uh, after he had been saved, after he'd been miraculously saved from the evil Voldemort and Quirrell. Uh, Dumbledore says, Your mother died to save you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love, as powerful as your mother's for you, leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved you is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person who had been marked by something so good. Love changes everything. And so Jesus, in his final conversation with Simon Peter, makes that the central topic. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. We are left a little bit lacking in the English language to only have one word for love where John, the writer of this gospel, had options he had multiple words that he could have used in Greek to describe love. And in fact, in this story, he chooses to use different words. Now, some commentators think that he used them synonymously. I'm not among the, that opinion. I can't see how John could have made this choice and just um, haphazardly made synonyms here because Jesus says, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me using the word agape? more than these. Do you love me with agape love more than these? 
Agape love, divine love, the love of self-sacrifice, the love that, that lays down its life for another person. Do you have that depth of love? Do you love me with an agape love more than these, more than you love anything else, more than you love your friends, more than you love your career, more than you love your life, more than you love yourself? Do you love me with an agape love more than you love anything else in the world? It's the question. It is the question. Do you love me? Jesus asks Simon, with an agape love that is deeper than your love for anything else in your life. And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter doesn't use the word agape for love. Peter uses the word phileo, a different Greek word for a different kind of love. It's the love of an iPad. It's the love of uh, Diet Coke. It's, uh, it's if you love books, you're a bibliophile, right? You have the word file from philia. If you've been to Philadelphia, you've, Philadelphia, you've been to the city of brotherly love, philia. So, so Peter answers, Simon answers with a different word. Yeah, Jesus, you know that I love you like a brother. Having been asked the question, having been asked by Jesus... Do you love me with a divine love that is greater than you love anything else in your life? Peter knows it would be folly to be dishonest at this point. And so he says, you know I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, well, it's important to note what Jesus doesn't say. Because Jesus doesn't say, uh, I'm sorry, but that's not what I asked. <laughs> That wasn't the question, Peter, but he doesn't say that. What Jesus says in reply is, feed my lambs. Take care of people. Take care of one another. The second time Jesus asks the question, he drops part of it and says, Simon, do you love me? Do you love me with an agape love? But he drops off the more than these. If it was too tough for you to compare your love for me with the love of the rest of your life, then maybe do you, do you just love me with an agape kind of love? That, and Peter says, I love you like a brother. I love you with that phileo love. You know, you know that. And Jesus is like, all right, all right. Tend my sheep. It's the same response. Take care of people. Take care of one another. Tend my sheep. The third time Jesus asked the question, Jesus changes the word. The third time the question is written down, John chooses to use the word phileo in Jesus' question. Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter is hurt. He is cut to the heart because he knows that he cannot pretend in front of Jesus that he cannot put up a false front. He knows that Jesus knows everything about him. And he says, yeah, yeah, that's how I love you. I love you with that phileo love, with that brotherly, I love you like a brother. And Jesus' response is exactly the same. All right then, take care of people. Take care of one another. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, take care of one another. Because you see, I'm, Jesus doesn't really, it's not on, I mean, it's not on his agenda to sort of give different ideas to different people about what we're supposed to do with Jesus' love. He, he tells us, however you love me, take care of people. However you love me. Tend my sheep. However you love me, feed my lambs. However you love me, just take care of one another. I don't care if you're as close to God as you've ever been or if you're so far away from God right now that you can barely see God. Take care of one another. That's what it comes down to. To live a life in God's love means to take care of one another. Peter's hurt because he knows he can do more. He knows he can be closer. Peter's hurt because Jesus asks him three times. And, P and Jesus had to ask him three times because why would he have had to ask me three times? Didn't he hear me answer it 
in the first place? I mean, I had to confess to him three times. Peter's hurt because this threefold question reminds him that just a, a little bit of time before, just a few days before, he had denied even knowing Jesus three times, Peter, three times. And the memory of that hurts. He was hurt because he realized he had closer that he he, he could get to Jesus. He had more work to do in his life. He had deeper that he could grow in his relationship, and he knew that Jesus knew it. But Jesus doesn't scold. He doesn't punish. He's not here to condemn. He's here to save. He's here to love. And so he says, look, wherever you are, just take care of one another, all right? Just love one another. Because you know what? Jesus is asking each one of us the very same question. Each one of us is posed the question, do you love me more than these? With an agape kind of love, Andy, son of Jim, do you love me? And it's no use for me to try to pretend I got to come to God open and transparent and vulnerable to, to say exactly what, no, I, I don't love you as much as I could. There are some things in my life that I place above you or at least on the same level as you. There's no use pretending. There's no use lying. We come to God open and vulnerable and transparent. And Jesus responds to all of us, well, that's all right. Just take care of one another, all right? Help each other grow closer. Help each other love more deeply. Help each other become disciples who live our lives shaped like Jesus. Help one another tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Because Jesus asks us and Jesus knows. So we might as well say, no, I, I, there are some Sunday mornings that I just, the alarm goes off and I just, turn it off and I can't get up and I'm too tired. There are some times that I, instead of going to worship, I'm, I'm working or I'm doing something else and I, and I really, I, I, there, I know that I should go more often. There are some times that I'm just there as a, as a, as a spectator instead of a participant and I need to engage. I, I know it. There are some times that, I, that I, I, I should be in a small group. I should be a part of a Bible study learning more and more about who you are, learning more about your holy word. God, I, I know that I don't love you like I should. I know that I should be giving 10%. I know that I'm not even close to a tithe right now. I know, God, that my generosity is lacking. I know, God, that I have not invited someone to come to church with me for like years now because it scares me. It kind of freaks me out, as a matter of fact. I know that I'm supposed to be doing that, and I know that I haven't done that. I know I'm not serving a person like I should because I'm casting judgment, and I'm, and I'm not looking at the person behind the need, and I'm, I'm not helping people. I know that I don't love you as much as I should. And Jesus says, that's all right. That's all right. I get that. Just take care of each other then. Just take care of each other. Just be the church together. Just lift one another up. Just uphold one another. Just make a choice to engage more fully in the life of a church. Just make a choice to engage more fully in worship or whatever it's going to be. Make a choice to deepen your commitment to Jesus Christ, to participate along with God's grace in what God is already doing in this world. And you know what will happen? When you make that choice, when you deepen that commitment, you're going to give me a call in a couple of weeks. And you're going to say, ah, can I come talk to you because something Great, it's happening in my life. I feel God's presence in an amazing way that I've never felt before. I sense God's grace all around me. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's leading, but it's good. I like it. <laughs> I want to share it. You see, when we live a holy life, some of you have probably noticed that the logo for this series has a W in front of the holy. It's, it's a, not a W that we put up there uh, by accident. And it's the next picture after the praying hands. Thank you. And that the W that is up there at the logo uh, of this series is because the holy life is a life that is whole, a life that is complete. And by whole, I don't mean it's done. I don't mean it's, it's something that's, that's finished. I mean it's balanced. It's a life that is in balance. Because your life has got a crazy kind of tendency to tip one way or the other. And one point it's tipping towards your career and you're spending 60, 70 hours at work and you're neglecting other things that you should be doing. At one point it's 
tipping towards your health or the health of a loved one. You can't focus on anything else. Another point, it's tipping and balancing towards your possessions or towards your prejudices or towards your greed or whatever it might be. Our lives get all out of balance unless they are whole, unless they are complete, unless God is at the fulcrum of our life. Unless God is at the center of everything that we say and do and everything that we are, and when God is at the center, it balances out. Everything else will balance out if God is truly the center. Commit this day to live a holy life. Commit this day to make God the center of everything that you say and do, everything that you think, everything that you are. Commit this day to make God the fulcrum of your life, and it will balance and it will be filled with love. Would you pray with me, please? We do commit ourselves to you, God. We commit ourselves to move you to the center of our lives, to, to, to rededicate ourselves to, to serving in your name, to giving, to worshiping, to sharing, to inviting, to following your son, Jesus Christ. God, you posed the question to us, asking each of us if we love you. And you already know. You already know exactly what that love looks like. We can't hide it from you. And so, God, today, we hear your call. We hear your invitation to feed, to tend, to care for, to be your church in this world, and to live a holy life. To you, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.